This is Hemming and Jessica, and you're listening to the Friendly Atheist Podcast. Please go to patreon.com slash friendly atheist podcast to support this show, get ad free episodes and exclusive bonus episodes. Mm-hmm. Everyone would like to know, Jessica, are you alive? I'm alive. I'm thriving. I'm fine. <laughs> Excellent. Glad I, you are better. Yeah. Nobody's ended up in the hospital this week. Nobody died. No tragedies happened this week. We are okay. <laughs> Very good. A lot of people express concern. Yeah. No, I genuinely appreciate everybody's hashtag thoughts and prayers. Um, <laughs> it was genuinely a really miserable and scary week for me. So, um, yeah, truly thank you, everyone, for my sweet writing student. When I saw her next, she was like, so you're going to live for more than five years, right? And I was like, <laughs> this is why children shouldn't Google things. Because yeah. I think she just Googled like kidney failure or something oh, like nice. that or whatever. Anyway, everything's fine. Um, I'm sorry I worried anybody, but that sucked. Okay, let's Glad do you're it. okay. Yep. I will make you feel better no, you with won't. this first story. There's certainly no chance of this. Um, <laughs> I swear, this was one of those stories that I thought, all right, it's a silly thing that happens for one day. It's not actually a story. And then it's all like Christian Twitter, TikTok was talking about oh, all week. It's great. Okay. okay, here's the backstory. This involves James River Church. Do you remember which church that is? Because no, we have talked about them in the past. That bell, though. It is the church we, that we discussed on this podcast because last year, a woman claimed I mean, that she, re- right she regrew three of her toes. <laughs> yes. And like they posted this as like, see, miracles happen. And then oh, we were like, yeah. do you got any evidence that she regrew her toes? And then they're like, shut up. They're like, she has toes. Yeah. So, so that's James Rivers, uh, James River Where Church. In it's in country? Springfield, Missouri. There you go. And it's a mega church. Like it's, it's, Ozarks they do a lot are, of big um, events. Ozarks are an underrated place of madness. Clearly. <laughs> so this church is also famous for hosting one of those men's conferences. Oh, and what brother. happens at a Christian men's conference? They rip phone books in half to show how much they love God. If you think Jessica is joking, she is not. Oh, I would that never joke the, about ripping phone books in half. That is it. the sort of thing that happens at men's conferences. And yeah. in fact... Use like, the power of Jesus to rip <laughs> a phone book in half, just like he did. Yeah. <laughs> this is one of those events where they invite... Only male pastors to speak to the men in the crowd. They Mm -hmm. invite professional bull riders, (laughs) boxers. Uh, Let's get an NFL quarterback to talk to all of you. Traditionally hyper masculine things. Yep. Last year they had like. Because you know the real problem in the world is men never got spaces to themselves. Never. It's a safe space (laughs) for alpha males. Um, Last year (laughs) they had like a giant monster truck just jump off a ramp in an arena and land on cars. Did it drive on water like Jesus? Yes, exactly. That would have been very funny. (laughs) They hosted their Stronger Men's Conference last week. Stronger Men's? That's what it's called. Not my words. Men's plural? Stronger Men's Conference. There is an apostrophe in there. That's terrible. I I think that means you have to be a stronger man. It's your conference, strong men. Yeah, I don't but know. stronger men's is... The grammar's compa- not important here. I mean, What's gra- important? first of all, grammar is <laughs> always important. So this is the sort of thing like you make fun of when you see other churches doing it. Because in other parts of the country, when they do men's conferences, yeah. like, here's the l- cowboy riding on a bull, and here's the lasso, and he's going to do something. And then three yes, minutes cowboys later... cowboys famously ride bulls to lasso it is. other bulls. And then they're like, <laughs> see? Jesus. And somehow they connect the dots. So this... Well, you I couldn't sit on the back of this angry bull that's trying to get me off if it weren't for the love of Jesus Christ. <laughs> and then they go back to their hotel rooms and have their massive men orgies. <laughs> yes, that's how all these... It's like Christian summer camp, but with only men. Honestly, I would watch like a 90s style erotic thriller about one of these camps when they're all like just fucking in the background. Honestly, let's yeah. get on that. Uh, I'm sure one of those Christian TV networks... No, they would take contra- out all the good uh, sexy stuff. Contract that. So anyway, this year... At the Stronger Men's Conference, (laughs) their entertainment, like one of the big entertainment, was this acrobat named Alex Magala. I had not heard of him, but if you look him up, basically, he's one of those guys whose resume includes every version of, like, blank Got Talent, America's Got Talent, Britain's Got Talent. He's been on, like, all of them, and he always impresses the audience because he does acrobatics. It's like Cirque du Soleil-style acrobatics. 
this guy is a sword swallower. Oh, and he oh does, he's like an old school geek. Uh-huh. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he does all this while like on a pole, no. aerial acrobatics while sword swallowing. Insanity. I mean, it's not my thing, but I get why it's a crowd pleaser. It's sure. like, oh my God, death defying and very cool. And like the one thing you need to know about sword swallowing is if an acrobat does that, Mm -hmm. uh, if a man does that anyway, they take off their shirt. And one of the reasons they do that is they want you to know, no, I really am swallowing this sword and I'm not hiding it in my suit somehow. It truly is just a human trick. It's not a magic trick. Right. And so anyway, this was their entertainment (laughs) for like night one of the conference. And I've seen video of this, like it leaked out of yeah. the Christian men's conference of this guy performing the thing. And here's what you see in the video. I'm not, I'm not uh, going to play audio because there's nothing for you to listen to. Can I come look at the video? Uh, no, it's not oh. that important. But basically the guy, uh, he's buff. He takes off his shirt and then starts climbing up the pole, doing aerial acrobatics on the pole. He swallows the sword. He's up the pole. He, his big finale yeah. is that he's hanging with his legs upside down from the pole with the sword in oh, his mouth insanity. and he basically drops ah! and then at the very last second he uses his feet as brakes before anything goes wrong so and he gets this is the terrifying terrifying to think about but he does it amazing like, it's a, what, like a flagpole trick pretty kind of much deal? okay i see okay so like you oh. can't do that stunt in a slippery overcoat you have to take off your shirt and you are sliding down the pole at death defying speeds and then he stops at the last second crowd goes wild what does any of that have to do with jesus doesn't matter doesn't matter the answer is nothing but neither do like you bull riders he's taken off BMX his shirt bikers. so many times i cannot wait it's to relevant. see how this plays in um it's bull and also ri- i'm mad you haven't let me see him without a shirt <laughs> You can see the man without his shirt. He is there. He is. It's not a great picture. It's not a great video because it's some dude in a crowd uh, just taking like vertical. Generic bald white guy. Yeah. Um, But again, if you are like, what does this have to do with Jesus? Well, Mm. what do BMX bikers and wrestlers have to do with Jesus? Nothing. But they're always invited to these men's conferences just after the guy who rips the phone book. Through God's all thing is through God. All things is possible. Like swallowing the sword. So anyway. (laughs) That's the entertainment. If I can swallow if- this sword, you can pass your history final, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> and the thing is, this happens on like night one. And honestly, I never would have heard of it if this is all that happened, because this sort of stupid shit happens at Christian conferences of course. all the time. Of course. For men. Okay. The problems begin. Oh. Like when he takes the next his shirt day. off. No, the oh. next day when one of the speakers at this conference, and I can't believe they invited him. It's Mark Driscoll. No, not Mark Driscoll. Yeah, We're who's done with him. Famously spiritually abusive to the point where he's such a cult ish figure, cult leader ish yeah. sort of person that his old church in uh, Washington State was like, We are done with you. And then he's like, Well, I'm going to reflect and think about. And, and then take two minutes off later. My shirt and swallow a sword. <laughs> no, and then two minutes <laughs> later, he starts another church like several hours away so yeah. that they don't know about all of his abuse. Yeah, because it's 1892 and you can just <laughs> move down the road like fucking Harold Hill. There you go. So. Uh, Mark Driscoll was invited to speak at this men's conference because n- no one is more Andrew Tate in the Christian world than this guy. God, I forgot about Andrew okay. Tate. So he begins his sermon mm-hmm. uh, and he's going to talk about, I don't know, wh- I don't know what he's going to say that you think your Christian men need to listen to Mark Driscoll, but I am going to play for you. Uh, about a minute of what he said to this conference because he's like, I can't wait to talk to you about Jesus. But first, we need to discuss something horrible that happened. Let me play this for you, then we'll talk. We're going to talk about how to be an Elijah. Yeah. An how Elijah. How to deal with they have at Jezebel. Uh-oh. But let me do this. Um, He's kneeling on the ground. Right? I've been up since 1 o'clock in the morning. Brad. The reason I'm hoarse is I have been praying for you, and my heart is very burdened for you. Burnt? Burdened. Oh, burdened. Yes, he's very sad for all oh. these people. And he's been praying so and hard. Yeah. I want to be very careful with this, and it's not what I want to say. Yep. But the Jezebel spirit has already been here. Oh. The Jezebel spirit opened our event. What? This is a rebuke and a correction of no one. This is an observation. <laughs> Just making an observation. Just saying. There was a platform. It was a high place. 
On it was a pole, an ashram. Wait for the same it. thing that's used in a strip club for women who have the Jezebel spirit to seduce men. In front of that was a man who ripped his shirt off <laughs> like a woman does in front of a pole at a strip club. Wait for it. It's still coming. That man then ascended. See, our God is not arrogant. He doesn't ascend. Our God is humble. He descends. And then he swallowed a sword and Jesus cried. Okay, Pastor John, I'll receive that. Thank you. Yeah, you're done. Okay, so now he's storming off stage. I will translate the end of that if it was hard to hear. But um, this is the audio that leaked out. Basically, what he said is there was a pole on stage, like in a strip club. Yep. And this, this man... Famously, the only place poles exist in the universe. Nowhere else. Uh, this man ripped his shirt off like a woman in front of a pole mm. at a strip club. And then he got mad that the man ascended up the pole because that God is, is my supposed favorite to descend. Part. Like, really? That's what you took away so from this? So he's never gone up a flight of stairs. He's never <laughs> taken an elevator. He's never stayed in a penthouse. He All only of you goes down, climbed down, up an down, elevator down. to get here. He's going to end in the Marianas Trench because he cannot <laughs> ascend anymore. All of us need to go to hell right now because that's how we do it here. We descend. What a wild and then he got thing mad to say. He ascended <laughs> and our God By descended. Way, that doesn't mean yes, anything. He ascended the pole. You know why the performer ascended the pole? So, so he, he could, could descend. descend. Right. That's the whole point. Anyway, and then he soloed a sword. And then you could hear someone, and it turned out to be the pastor organizing the whole event, oh, I saying so. like, uh, you're done. You're done. He said uh, something like, uh, you've said enough or whatever. You're out of line, he said. You're out of line, Mark. You're done. That's the church's leader. His name is John Lindell. Um, and that's when Mark Driscoll storms off stage. That's very fun drama. Holy. Yeah, this is the thing. Because it's like, oh, this is why all these Christians are like fed up about it. And here's the thing. If you follow this drama on they're Twitter. They're fed up with Driscoll or they're fed up with this, this kind is the of thing. display? Who are, who's the right person to be mad at here? Because part of me is like, Driscoll's Nobody. the crazy one because, be... well, I'll summarize it for you. Some people are mad at Driscoll because he's using the platform provided by this conference to rip on the conference. Uh -huh. He's mad at this performer for what he claims is, I don't know whether he was mad that it was like homoerotic when I you're swallowing the sword. Theory. Or I he's think mad he that he took a off his shirt. <laughs> and he doesn't feel good about it. That is, an, that is one theory. And again, are you mad at Driscoll for calling that out? Because you don't get that it was just an acrobatic performance. Like, calm down, dude. That wasn't like a stripper routine. By I the way, the performer who did that mm. has performed at strip clubs in the past. And this is what a lot of Driscoll supporters were pointing out. If you look at his resume or you look at pictures online, this guy who is buff has performed at strip clubs and stuff. But I want to be clear, who cares at this conference, and I saw the video of it, he was doing an acrobatic act, just like he did on all those TV shows. So, like, he's not performing a strip routine. We can joke about it all we want, but that was a pretty standard circus-like performance. You know that in itself wasn't weird. You know so what is Mark Driscoll mad about? Yes. Um, I, uh, as people may or may not know, started my life as a ballet dancer um, and, and danced through college. And there is something about being a dancer of any stripe that is sexualized. It probably has to do with tight clothing. It probably has to do with like putting your body in strange positions that make people think about weird things. I, I can't explain it. But I will say that there has always been a creepily sexualized element to especially young women dancing. Um, and so I'm wondering, genuinely, I'm wondering, it, it, it kind of feels like the whole like, straight guys try to be so straight it's like do you even like women at all it feels like it was too close to being feminine and that just <laughs> set off fire alarms in his head like i, and I Mark genuinely Driscoll feel like famously he, sees the jezebel spirit everywhere uh, yeah, I, I, everything is lustful everything is temptation everything is demonic i mean that's what mark driscoll says about everything I, because i think I, I feel like I know that like people who live in this sort of like hyper purity culture, anything 
feels sexualized, right? So anything that isn't like completely covered up head to toe and not making eye contact with men is sexualized. Therefore, like if I am dancing and I say I'm doing a bunch of lifts with somebody, probably going to have my top off. I'm probably going to have a sports bra on because you need like skin to skin contact for things Mm -hmm. like that. That's not because I want to like be sexy up on a guy. It's because he needs to grab my tummy so I don't fall on my face. And like these people have such a disconnect with their bodies and with like how the world works that anything that even like winks at like sex or nudity or something a little like dangerous in that kind of way is immediately terrifying to them and like what a fucking sad life that is right and again this is why you don't invite mark driscoll to your conference but again he says ridiculous bullshit all the time and the funny thing is if you're mad you're mad at the wrong thing here if you're mad why are you mad at the performer who did what he does on tv all the time and you could criticize and say that performance was a waste of money you could say this the Bible has everything you need to get excited about Jesus. You don't need entertainment like that. He could have condemned the fact that they invited idiots like him to speak there. <laughs> there are so many things wrong with the conference. Instead, he's like, this homoerotic imagery resembles lady strippers. Um, like, Which, honestly. Like, honestly, isn't it? Oh my the God, they're the so crowd. fucking broken. Like, isn't this supposed to be like a display of masculinism? I, hey, Masculinity is the word. <laughs> the men in the crowd would have been better off watching an actual stripper than listening to Mark Driscoll. Yeah. He, who poses an actual long-term threat yes. to their mental health. <laughs> I just don't know. But anyway, the performer was harmless. He was hired to do a stage show. He did it. It went exactly as you would expect. Calling that anti-Christian or the Jezebel spirit, because Mark Driscoll sees mm-hmm. sex everywhere he goes. Yeah. That's a Mark Driscoll problem, not anyone else's. Finding a way to blame women somehow for this all-male review mm-hmm. is a very much a Driscoll specialty. Mm-hmm. And again, then there's the, another, there's the other side that is mad at John Lindell for calling out Mark Driscoll for calling him out. Let like, them fight. <laughs> yeah. Um, by the way, Lindell then took the stage to the booze of a lot of people in the crowd really? right after Mark Driscoll stormed off. And he basically said, I'm paraphrasing here, I don't have the audio on me. He basically said, if Mark wanted to say that, he should have said it to me first. That's 100% he did not. true. He said, I talked to Mark for half hour, like between that performance and now. He's like, there was not one word of that. He's out of line. If he wanted to say it, he could say it to me. You may not agree with me. You may not agree with him, but we are brothers in Christ and there's a right way to handle disagreement. God, I hate when I feel like he's the good guy in this. Like, that's a very reasonable argument of like... Fine, think whatever you want to think. That was not the way to do that. By the way, th- it's almost what like you Mark Driscoll here. just wants to aggrandize himself and maybe not well, the Lord. He brings drama wherever he goes. <clears throat> well, so this do is I, a Christian. But I'm not like <laughs> shutting conferences down. This is the epitome of a Christian men's conference for you. You have one asshole delivering a diatribe about a performance he doesn't understand, uh-huh. but insists he's an expert about. Then you have another asshole shouting at him from off stage yeah. before pretending that the real concern is that disagreements ought to be raised in private, while never apologizing for inviting the first asshole to the event at all. And by Mike the way, Driscoll's the first asshole or the yes. sword is the first asshole. No, sword swallower is oh. fine. I He's don't care hero. about him. <laughs> um, yeah. John <laughs> Lindell, like for what it's worth, the idea that all disputes ought to be handled in private. No, 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 no. That makes it too easy for real problems. Not like what Driscoll was talking about, but real problems to be swept under the rug. Cause Christian pastors all the time say we can handle everything privately. Um, and the only reason we've talked about sexual abuse in the church is because people said, ah, I don't yeah. trust you to handle it publicly. I feel so like that's you're the kind thing. of setting up a false binary here of either we talk about this in like quiet alcoves or we stand on a stage and just yell at people. Sure. I feel like there's a, you can do there's both. a middle I do, ground, which I is... I do understand Lindell's point of Driscoll could have raised his concerns to me earlier. Because he's if not he raising to. concerns like this is dangerous or this person right. is in trouble. He's just like, he finds it distasteful and that's <laughs> dumb. Sure. So it's almost like these people think that their opinions are the most important thing in the world. And when their opinions <clears throat> clash, they just can't stand it. <laughs> it's again, what happens when alpha males collide and yeah. one calls another out? It's like, <gasps> you are debasing me. An immovable ob- object <laughs> and an unbreakable target or whatever The it two is. men, like the next day, appeared on stage together in what I guess they build as a way of public reconciliation. <gasps> do you think it's but, all staged? Uh, I don't think the first part was staged. I do think whatever they decided we need to talk about this stuff on stage. So whatever. But since that time, uh, 
like Driscoll's gone back home to his alcove or wherever his man <laughs> den. Um, since then, Lindell has delivered a sermon like at his church because this is now the only thing anyone cares about. And now he's going back to like calling out Mark Driscoll. This is what he said during his recent sermon. If he doesn't listen to the rebuke, like any believer should not have anything to do with Mark Driscoll. I get absolutely no joy or delight in doing this to someone who I have called a friend. Mark, if you're listening to this message, we love you. And it's with a heavy heart we are calling you to repent. And what does he want him to repent for? Oh my God, I love it. It's so stupid. It's so stupid. The pastor, Lindell, says, how dare you malign Alex Magala, who he says the is a real born again, the real victim, who he says is a born again Christian. Oh, is he? I didn't know that. I don't part. know if he is, but that's what the pastor said. He said you attempted to sow disunity in my church. You made false and slanderous accusations against my son. I don't even know what that's about. Uh-oh. You were trying to create Sons division in my family. I don't know what that's about. <laughs> you were trying to destroy my church by attacking its leadership. This is Driscoll saying this? No, this is Lindell. Oh. This is now this guy. Fuck? He's like, I guess after their quote unquote reconciliation on stage, Driscoll has gone on to just say, like, oh, well, your son's boy. a problem and your other son's a problem. And how dare your church is led by this guy? Who invited the stripper man It's so fun to watch people's oh. true colors Come out and they're all Oh we're brothers in Christ And I, we all have the same goal And then they're like Your son's fucking Jezebel's on the side <laughs> Like oh it's so good Like y'all you can't agree among yourselves And you have one percent difference in opinion Like get it together idiots I, I tried following this after the weekend's event and it got so out of control like a I'm timeline like, yeah <laughs> the chronological timeline of what is happening now is impossible to follow because everyone's talking shit about each other and um, now i am at the point of let them moi. fight it's great oh it's so good because none of you are the good guys in any of this uh so i just said so good and my dog looked up to me like me <laughs> <laughs> i'm doing good by I'm the eating. way in case you are all wondering uh did Everyone at this men's conference, did they spend time packaging food for the hungry? No, that took place at the American Atheist Conference over Easter Uh. last week. Uh, They did not do that. Uh, And they did not have tanks or monster trucks, as far as I could tell, at the Atheist event either. That's too bad. Yeah. No more Driscoll either. I do do feel like atheists could use a little more. Like, listen, I'm not saying we need monster monster trucks, but, like, I wouldn't be mad if somebody ripped a phone book in front of me. (laughs) If you take your Prius. Yeah. (laughs) Drive it off the ramp. That's and it will silently roll over the top of the old cars that are made out of... <laughs> and we will all golf clap. <laughs> and guess what? Great gas mileage that whole time. Right, right. <laughs> so that's the Christian men's conference for you. Wait, what's the equivalent of atheists doing a monster truck? Is it driving their Prius to like a park and I picking mean, up some garbage? I thought you were going to say what's the equivalent of a atheist men's conference. And the answer is every conference, conference before yeah, yeah. circa 2019 or something like that. I um, gotten invited to a conference the Center in a really for Inquiries Board of Directors is an atheist men's conference. <laughs> <laughs> Can somebody invite me to a thing? I want to travel. I don't have any money. I need somebody to pay for me to go to like Nebraska or something like that. To I just need to rally. leave this house. There you go. So wow. good times. What I don't think a time to I don't be think alive. This con- I don't think this controversy is over, but I don't know what's happening anymore because well, it's so crazy. It's also one of those things of like, w- w- it, it, it's so silly. It just has to play itself out, right? Like, there's just no, there's no stopping this thing. Like, let's just see what I, happens. I do want to make Maybe fun of them for cry. Why would you bring an acrobat to as the entertainment? Why do you need entertainment at these men's conferences? Part of me wants to make fun of that, well, but really, I genuinely want to know why would you invite Mark Driscoll to your men's conference? Like, there's isn't he persona non grata in that whole community? Or unless how? you are in that circle where oh, you yeah. think Mark Driscoll is a strong male, and if that's your idea of what a good Christian man should be, your whole premise is broken. Like, your conference is full of the worst people. Mm. And again, it's not like there's a shortage of Christian men who can talk. There's a million of them. But why would you invite that guy to be a speaker? I mean... That's There's the a finite mistake. number of white dudes in the country, haven't yes. You know, they might be turning through them too We're quickly. down to a dozen. Mikey's been getting calls <laughs> right <laughs> and center. <laughs> oh, let us move on. Um, I have a quick question. Yes. Uh, what's the name of the pastor who you have a love-hate relationship with? Um, Greg Locke. Yeah. yeah. Did he 
burn Bibles? No, there was a Christian group that brought Bibles to his church like a week ago, Uh and they burned copies of the Bible because they see him as a blasphemer. Again, this is the Christian infighting where I'm like, whatever, let them fight. It Whatever. made it over to uh, last podcast on the left. They started <laughs> mentioning his name. I was like, wait a second. Yes. My worlds are colliding. <laughs> I might have you reach out to them because you have a special relationship with Greg Locke. <laughs> Let me tell you about my bestie. <laughs> yeah. All right. Let's talk about uh, Wisconsin. Is that so, why you have sin? Is that it's is short for Wisconsin? Yes. Uh, earlier Sometimes I this like month, to interpret Heaven's weird notes. It just says notes. sin. Yeah. So <laughs> earlier this month, uh, Madison, Wisconsin is in Dane County, is in Dane County, and they have their board of supervisors. And at their county, I don't know what you said, and I'm moving on. (laughs) I said medicine. Yeah, worst joke. No, no. Do you want me to say it again? No. So the Dane (laughs) County board, they were thinking earlier this month, should we give a grant of $231,005 to a group called Porchlight, which is a nonprofit group that helps the homeless by giving them shelter, food, access to telehealth, does a bunch of stuff. Mm, They don't need that. They need Bibles. I know. Well, the Porchlight, Porchlight does a lot of good stuff. The city, the county was like, should we give them money to help us with these issues? And everything. Everyone said, yeah, that seems like a reasonable request. And then Jesus there was, was like, There was one person. This is a council with like two dozen members. Oh, wow. Uh, and it this grant proposal passed pretty unanimously, except there was one person who was against it, and he spoke out against it. <clears throat> and his name is Jeff Wygand, <clears throat> and he stood up to explain his opposition before they all took a vote on this. And I do want to play for you uh, what he said, because what he started saying is, um, I I like everything this group is doing. We do want to help these people. Um, And I'm going to paraphrase here. What he said is, this is this grant for a lot of money. It's like a bandage. He says, for every dollar we invest in providing someone a temporary place to sleep, we should be investing an equal amount or putting an equal amount of energy towards finding solutions toward the root cause of okay. homelessness. And then and he goes on like this for like a minute or two. And then he sits down and another supervisor says, what, what are you talking about? Like, what do you think we ought to be spending money on? That's not this. And he says specifically, like, what do you think is the root cause of homelessness? And then our friend Jeff Wygan stands up. Oh, the smile on his face. Cause oh, he knew this question. For this he's been waiting for this moment. He's been waiting for this question. And I'm going to play for you what he said in response to that question. Since you asked, you'll get an answer. Yep. Sin is the root cause. Oh my God. Keep going. Oh please record it. Please, please record it. It is being recorded. Thank you. Oop. Sin is the root cause. On the record. When God created this world, there was no sin. He created a perfect world. Man ruined that by sinning. And we've seen the depravity and the decline of our world ever since then. So when we talk about the root cause, if you really want to go back to why we have mental health issues, to why we have greed, to why we have people being mean to other people, it's sin. And until we address that issue... We're going to continue to see this issue of homelessness and a whole slate of other issues in our society. So thank you for asking the question. Like Christians trying to take over the country and take (laughs) away my rights personally? Uh Uh-huh. So, by the way, you can't see this in the audio, obviously, but at the end of that video, he sits down. (laughs) There is a lady behind him. I think she's a supervisor. Has this look on her face like, the fuck did you just say? Oh, I love it. It was glorious. But again, first of all, he was the lone vote against the funding so at least that wasn't impacted by this i mean does anything really sum up a conservative better than hey we're gonna try to put this stopgap measure in place no we need to do a universal relook at what we're doing in the first place so i'm it's, voting no it's okay the same what thing do you want to conser- do nothing yeah it's the same thing conservatives do after a mass shooting it's like well we should do something about guns then right and it's always well no of course not let's go back to sin they, it's the well, same answer they, they get for w- that too it's like okay but in the meantime be- if they actually the fact, were worried about mental illness, it would be much easier for me to get an appointment with my psychiatrist. <laughs> right. It's not just a pointless answer. It's an impractical one. For starters, 
It's I mean, not an let's, answer. It's not an answer, but let's take it seriously for a second. Let's say you believe in that biblical nonsense. There's literally no way to resolve the issue because how do you fix sin? I mean, you could blame Eve all you want. You can't force her to uneat a piece of fruit, which means what does he want? He wants taxpayer dollars spent on what? Converting people to Christianity rather than helping them with their pressing needs? Not only would that be illegal, the board would be turning its back on helping the community, which is like the one job they were elected to do. Let's say they did put money toward fixing the sin problem, however they would do that. What should the community do in the meantime when it comes to assisting people with mental health struggles or homelessness or being mean? Like, (laughs) nothing if people like this had their way, because they've done enough. They are now putting money towards sin. Because what happens? Like, is a switch going to magically flip on after one week of the sin initiative and solve all their problems? Of course not. The most Christian states in America have the highest gun death rates, worst health care, least education. More Jesus has never been the solution to anything. He's also making this crass assumption that the unhoused people who could benefit from Porchlight's generosity are struggling because of sin. So victim blaming. As if they brought this upon themselves, which anyone who's looked at the homelessness issue knows, it's often not the result of any personal failures, but larger systemic ones. Like Mm -hmm. at a local level, giving money to a nonprofit that helps the homeless is an important way to address concerns. Mm -hmm. It's like a a county council, city council. They can also build affordable housing. That's another possible solution. Those are things within their power to address the issue. Well, and I think also, besides being wrong about all of the things he thinks and believes and and holds dear, um, it truly, like, study after study shows that if we're dealing with people who are unhoused and dealing with addiction or mental health issue, health issues, if you get them a home, Mm -hmm. shit gets better because guess what you can't do when you do not have a home apply for a job. Yeah. Reading the Bible is a lot easier when you have a place to do it. Truly. Like it it just true. It's so like, I feel like people do not understand, especially people like this, do not understand that, like, if you gave a desperately poor person $10,000 or whatever, it would change their life. And they would spend it. They would not be hoarding it somewhere. They would spend it. They would get what they need. And, but instead, instead of doing things like that, we're like, oh, let's make sure, like, rich people only pay 4% in taxes or whatever. Like, the solution to these things is money. And guess what we have a fuck ton of? Money. So maybe we can just go ahead and help people not die instead of making Sorry, sure that's not the a Christian billionaire answer. saves $3 million in taxes that they will never even be able to spend because they'll die before they can do it. Um, elected officials have an obligation to use the resources they have to help the people in their communities who need it. I mean, they should be basing their decisions on data and facts. And for a county supervisor to pretend that a lack of religion is the biggest problem everyone faces, Mm. that's an admission that he has no business in elected office. He should be the pastor of a church and wasting their time, not wasting a seat that could go to someone who actually cares about the people in Dane County. So there's a news outlet, nonprofit news outlet, Madison 365. They asked him in a follow-up, like, explain your thinking here. And he told them, well, my church helps the poor and addresses sin. And they're like, what church is that? He's like, I'm not telling you. Oh, he's <laughs> keeping a little secret. I guess so. Just like Jesus did. Uh-huh. And then they're like, so tell us how your church helps the poor and addresses sin. Here's what he said. I'm quoting here. That's the model I think works the best because the church individuals, people one-on-one, can determine the difference between someone that wants to continue to make poor decisions and someone that doesn't, someone that truly wants to turn their life around. And then they're like, so anyone can get help from your church? No. (laughs) Here's what he says. If we're going to physically give you help, we're going to do a Bible study with you. You don't have to believe it. You could sit there and check the box, but we are going to because we believe that's the true solution. We're also not going to turn someone away if they have a physical need. If you have a physical need, come on in. We just ask you sit through this Bible study. If you don't want to listen, that's fine. It's spiritual so coercion. Embarrassing. Like that's how his church does it. Oh, you want some food? Are you hungry? Fine, but you got to sit through this timeshare presentation first. Oh my god! And then maybe we'll give you what you. If want. you're lucky. <laughs> if you don't want to waste your time in Bible study, though, I guess that means everyone just starves if they come to his church for help. I mean, it truly. 
can he hear himself? No, like, he cannot. Like, <laughs> truly. I just... The guy who asked the question, like, what do you think the root cause is of homelessness that set up this whole rant? His name is Anthony Gray. He's another supervisor. And he also issued a follow-up statement um, in an interview on Monday, according to Madison 365. It wasn't until the fourth or fifth time that it dawned on me what he was actually saying. <laughs> Once fourth I, or fifth time? <laughs> I don't know why it took that long. Once I figured it out, I realized how vile and disgusting it was to blame homelessness on the unhoused. I knew that if I opened mm-hmm. the door for him, he would stop talking in dog whistles and speak truth. Basically saying, yeah, I knew what he was going to say. Of and I he wanted did. him to say it yeah. out loud. Oh, by the way, that guy's a practicing Episcopalian. Oh. So, like, he's religious, too. He also added, the reason people are homeless is because they don't have homes. The reason people have mental illness is because they're sick. Blaming the victim is the coward's way out. Like, yeah, buddy, oh my you're God, right. I'm in love with right, this guy. Right, that guy's great. So he's like, I gave Wygan the opening to basically dig his own hole. Oh, yeah, he gave him enough rope to hang himself with. Um, another supervisor, her name is Dana Pelabon. She also said there's a racial element to what he said, too, because many of the unhoused people in Dane County are black. And if you want to talk about root oh, causes no. for racism, well, guess what? It's not hard to find a religious connection component in there as well. Here's what she said. Where did you say this if, was? I'm sorry, what's uh, Madison in oh, Wisconsin. Dane County. She said, if he really wants to talk about the root causes, if he really, if he wants to talk about sin, then he needs to go back in history and look at the root causes of how it is that black folks are treated and the sins that were perpetrated against us. Fair point. Like, right on. Let's <laughs> move to Madison, Wisconsin and just hang out Madison's with these people. I like them. Um, by the way, it's not the first time something like this has happened. In 2023, Dane County officials voted to make their county a sanctuary for trans and non-binary people. Mm. This is the last year. Wygand was also the only supervisor to vote against that. Oh, my God. When can we vote him out? Well, um, <laughs> by the way, also in the wake of it this week... Dozens of local religious leaders wrote an open letter denouncing him. Here's part of what they said. It was a long letter. Yeah, local religious leaders said, Supervisor Wygand, we write to you in the spirit, in whatever, to call on you to be more careful with your words concerning the communities oppressed and marginalized, dot, dot, dot. Not only is this statement deeply hurtful, that sin is the root cause of homelessness, not only is this statement deeply hurtful and divisive in our community, it is simply wrong and certainly contradicts the teachings of Jesus Christ, dot, dot, dot. Jesus did not see unhoused people as sinful and problematic. Rather, he continually characterizes theologies like yours Mm. that infer that only bad and sinful people are unhoused as problematic. So, like, even religious people in the community, leaders, are against him. I looked this up, too, because I'm like, yeah, can you vote this guy out? How much? And the thing is, he's not up for re-election for a while. But he was up for re-election, I believe, last November. He won. This is one of those races where, like, 1,000, 1,500 votes are all it takes to win. Uh He won that race last year by 156 votes. Over his opponent. <laughs> and in 2022, when he was first up, uh, I, by the way, I'm sorry, I think it was last month that the re-election happened, and he won by 156 votes. In 2022, oh when he was up for election for the first time, uh, he won that term by 33 votes. Which is to say, voting matters. Voting uh, matters. Local Run elections. for local office. If you're listening to this, please, yeah. local please, God. elections matter because be most clear. people ignore them. Hemet and I cannot run for, <laughs> for office. We're tainted. We're broken people. Yes. You, though, you, <laughs> you, you're the smartest person in your town. You should be running it. Yeah. The, I mean, if you vote for Christian nationalists at any level or you allow other people to vote for them and you're not out, uh, you're not counter. Uh, counter voting them, whatever the word is. Yeah, Sorry, counter voting. I don't know. Voting? Like you're gonna end up with guys like this yeah. in charge of making decisions that affect everybody. How old? Can you give me your old age range of this gentleman? You know what? I don't know off the top of my head. He looks like he's like in his thirties. Like our age? Yeah. Mm, okay. For some reason, in my head, he was like a twenty-five year old dude. He like might be. that really. I wouldn't put that. That was really tracked for me. It's not like thirty, forty year old Christians in political office don't say the exact same stuff. Oh, of course. Right. So, <laughs> so that's what's wow. happening in the world of sin. Wow. Good job, Wisconsin. (laughs) (laughs) I mean, thank goodness everyone else on that county uh, council is apparently awesome. Yeah, I mean, yeah, I feel like Madison, Wisconsin is a good place for good people, except for that guy. Except for one dude who found a way to get in there. Uh, Okay, let's talk about 
a Christian. Uh, you know, there's been this push to get chaplains in public schools. I do know that. We have talked about this much. It's a bad idea. Yeah. So now at <laughs> least 14 states, including Texas, Florida, and Kansas, have proposed or passed legislation to give public schools permission to hire chaplains on their staff. And in some cases, like in Texas, if you hire chaplains... You can do that in lieu of hiring actual experts, social workers, uh, counselors, things like that. And supporters say this is how we can address staffing shortages and improve mental health. Opponents say, I think those why don't you pay people money. more? <laughs> yeah. Uh, Texas, by the way, has a massive budget surplus. They are spending zero of it I on hiring people. I get this all the time. Texas has a budget surplus, but they're saving it up for some imaginary civil war they're going to start <laughs> instead of, I don't know, educating their children. Right. They don't care about education. Uh, Opponents also say oh, students book deserve. Never gotten anyone, right? Opponents say students deserve qualified experts, mm. not randos with questionable credentials mm-hmm. who just want to proselytize. And this is the question: even if you hire chaplains, what are the credentials they need to be a chaplain? And the answer is there are None. no credentials. It's whatever some group says they are. And what about proselytizing? Are you going to ban that if they're working at a public school? The answer in some cases is no. Of course not. Um, in fact, the Texas senator who sponsored that state's bill said his goal was, quote, representing God's presence within our public schools. Yep. <laughs> so uh, recently in Oklahoma, a chaplain bill passed through committee that would not require background checks, doesn't require any qualifications. No and allows background chapl- checks. Yep, and allows chaplains to proselytize to students. We have background checks for our volunteers who like brush horses. We perform background checks because they're near a population that deserves to be protected. In my case, it's people with disabilities. In their case, it's a child, but no. In Texas, they don't get a background check and they are handed seven machine guns when they (laughs) enter. Um, A Houston Chronicle report, by the way, in 2022 said that in Texas public schools, 98 uh, Texas public schools that serve 98% of students do not meet the Texas Education Agency's recommendation of one counselor per 250 students. And it's their own laws. It's not even like a federal law. It's their own stupid laws. And they're like, "Mm." Texas has a budget surplus of $32.7 billion. They are not addressing this issue. Anyway. That, we've this? talked about this in the past. That's not where I'm going with I this. I know, but it's just so upsetting. It is extremely upsetting. So in Texas, more than 100 chaplains, just like that religious group in Dane County, Wisconsin, they signed a letter urging state school boards, I know you have permission now to do this. Please don't. don't oh my God, don't please do don't. It. Oh please my don't, God, don't. Please don't hire us to like be in your schools. It's a horrible idea. That to me is the most like... They don't even think this is a good idea, dude. Like, what the fuck? That is correct. So the thing is, even if chaplains were prohibited from evangelizing in public schools, their presence sends a message that Christianity alone can solve problems, which is not true. The entire assumption that chaplains are beneficial rests on the idea that mental health problems are the result of, like, a lack of proper spirituality. Mm -hmm. That's not true. So anyway, the group that's been lobbying and pushing for all of this in all these states. It's a group called the National School Chaplain Association. Literally, its entire reason for being is to get these laws through as many red states as possible. The the leader of that organization is a guy named Rocky Malloy. He's a self-described, his bio is like a movie come to life. He's like, I used to be an international drug trafficker. But now I found Jesus. And that now means I want to get snuck a joint into <laughs> Canada once. I don't know, but uh, now he's like, now I gotta get God into public schools. Sure. So this week he appeared on the Wall Builders show, which is the ministry of David Barton, oh, pseudo historian yeah. David Barton. Basically, they interviewed him. Uh, one of the co-hosts interviewed Rocky Malloy to say, like, well, why do chaplains need to be in public schools? And the co-host of that show, Rick Green, he basically said, hey, let me ask you, this whole thing, chaplains in schools, couldn't it backfire if, say, a Satanist group uh, used these laws to get their people into public schools? And everybody takes out their pieces of paper and starts (laughs) writing down their plans. I'm going to play for you what Rocky Malloy said in response to this, because I think it's extremely telling. Lots of audio elements. You know he's heard this complaint before, uh, and I'll play for you the question, and then first voice you hear is Rick Green, then you will hear Rocky Malloy responding to it. Let's talk about those states now 
where it's happening. Some people get concerned that, okay, if you open the door to this, do you have to let a, you know, a, 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 a Satanist uh, church or a, a whatever they call themselves, you know, come in and, and uh, take that job on the campus? I mean, what's the what's the parameters for what a chaplain is or isn't? Here's Rocky Malloy. Well, you know what? I think, uh, Rick, that's a very legitimate question, but it comes with a certain amount of really lack of information. There's no such thing as a satanic chaplain. I know they threaten that, but there are none. And there's not one satanic chaplain hired by the federal government. Zero. They don't qualify. So it's a red a, herring, really. They raise the people raise this, but it's an it's a non existent challenge. It's non existent. It's a it's a it's a typical demonic threat. They have no resources. They have no chaplains. No chaplains recognized. Because they don't qualify, a thing called black letter laws, U.S. Constitution. If you blaspheme God, you do not qualify to be a religion. So no Satanist can get a job saying equal access because they're not in that group. Oh, that's good. That's good. <laughs> I love that. Oh, man, you know this stuff. He does not know he this stuff. He does not stuff. know this stuff. No. Um, Let's talk about a couple well, of those I'm claims. I'm just a simple country <laughs> lawyer, and in my day, yeah. we just thought a hog was a hog. I asked the Satanic Temple's uh, Lucian Greaves, uh, what do you think about all this? Because you're the Satanist. Mm -hmm. He said, I find it too incredible to take seriously the notion that Rocky Malloy, despite dedicating his career to peddling half-assed chaplain certificates through infomercial-style coursework, Nonetheless, know so little about chaplaincy and First Amendment religious protections. Hmm. Um, the fact is, there are satanic chaplains because the satanic temple, by all of these people's own definition, can set up their own rules and employ their own chaplains and say, yep, here's your stamp of approval. You're a chaplain now. And a lot of these states, with very loose restrictions, like, what are you going to say? Uh, no, your stamp doesn't count. Like, no, that's not true. There are literally and very seriously humanist chaplains mm -hmm. who go through a certification process. So there are non-Christian chaplains we recently out get, there. Um, secular chaplains in the military or not quite. Oh, okay. Um, but we will talk about that. Like, okay. there is a in Alabama. There's a chaplain bill that was considered. Uh, I think today as we're recording this and one of the attorneys with the freedom from religion foundation literally submitted testimony in Alabama saying that comments like his Rocky Malloy's undercut any suggestion that chaplains are intended to do anything other than promoting religion generally and Christianity specifically. That's and a here's, fair assessment. here's how wrong he is about all this stuff. When blasphemy was for like blasphemy was forbidden in the U.S. well into the 20th century. Mm -hmm. And those laws eventually fell by the wayside under like the umbrella of free speech. Mm -hmm. But even if the question of whether atheism is a religion is like a philosophical one, mm -hmm. the United States effectively treats atheism as a religion when it comes to First Amendment issues. Right. So in 2017, to address your point, when the U.S. military expanded its list of faith groups, Rocky Malloy said... Um, there is not one satanic chaplain hired by the federal government. It's very Zero. specific. Yeah. He said, he, if you, very sure he said, if you blaspheme God, you do not qualify to be a religion. I'm well, in 2017, sure the U S military literally issued a statement saying we're expanding our list of faith groups that you can label yourself as in the military. That those labels now include humanist, atheist, agnostic, no religion, no preference, pagan, and Satan, like, so I they love are non religious people are so persnickety. Some people Dude. are like, no religion, and some are like, no preference. <laughs> okay. Um, Satanism <laughs> is not on their list. However, there are plenty of categories under which Satanists could put themselves. And sure. the IRS says the Satanic Temple is a church. So all the stuff he's saying about, well, it's not a religion, it doesn't qualify. They blaspheme, so you don't count. No, they do count, literally, yeah. under the U.S. law. What about the notion that there are no satanic chaplains hired by the federal government? I mean, that's true. There are no secular chaplains hired by the military, which is where you would see those chaplains. But that's controversial precisely because there are impeccably qualified candidates who have been rejected as chaplains mm -hmm. for reasons that make no sense. So you can't say, see, we don't do it. Yeah, past prejudice sure. is not and should never be a basis for future prejudice. Mm -hmm. So you can't say like, well, we are racist in the past, so I guess we ought to just keep that <laughs> We going. nailed it then. I yeah. bet we can do it again. Well, and the other thing is that I think maybe people who are like rah-rah pro-military should be a little more troubled by is... 
if I'm an atheist and I want to join the army because I make poor decisions, no, I'm just kidding. Whatever. Shut up, Jessica. Um, <laughs> like if I'm joining the army and I'm an atheist, that means I don't, I am, I don't get that kind of treatment. This I, is the I argument don't... a lot of military atheists have been making, which is that there's a substantial number of non explicitly non-religious people in the military. They also go through mental health struggles. Mm -hmm. They would benefit from talking to someone who could, whether I mean, it's a counselor, a psychiatrist, or therapist, anybody. but whatever. Right. I mean, Let's they would benefit nuts. from talking to people. And while religious Christian members of the military have chaplains they could talk to precisely for that reason, what are atheists, agnostics, whoever, what are they supposed to do in the military? Because talking to a spiritual chaplain right. who doesn't get where they're coming from, does not have advice for them that doesn't bring God into the picture, that is unfair to those members of the military. And that's the argument for why it would the military ought to allow certified humanist chaplains into their ranks. They have not done that yet. Um, it's not something that people have been fighting for, especially in the past few years. Mm -hmm. But that's the argument for why you ought to have them. But the fact that you don't have them right now is not a justification to keep that going. But even without that label, though... It's many of appeal these to tradition. Yeah, many of these chaplain in school laws give virtually free reign to groups to certify their own chaplains, which means public schools may have to consider giving non-Christian or non-theistic chaplains access to kids if they want to play this game. Mm -hmm. And in Iowa, for example, they had a chaplain bill they were considering. It died. It didn't get passed. But before that happened, before that last vote took place, a satanic temple minister said in, like, during the committee hearings, the state has, quote, several ordained ministers of Satan, and we would be happy to engage mm -hmm. children. In Utah, where a similar bill was also defeated, a satanic temple leader told lawmakers she was, quote, ready to embrace this new potential role within Utah's communities. And in Florida, where a chaplain bill is still under consideration, mm. the leader of a local atheist group said, quote, we will definitely be pursuing opportunities to be involved in this program if this bill passes. Which is to say, the bottom line is if a state wants to allow chaplains in schools, they will not be able to discriminate against non-Christian or non-religious groups, mm -hmm. all of which would be able to certify chaplains however they see fit. Yeah. They have resources. They may have chaplains. They would qualify. And yeah, they might blaspheme God in the process because why the hell not? None of that can legally prevent them from taking part in a program like this. And uh, Patrick Elliott, an attorney with FFRF, he told me in an email, it is obviously unconstitutional for the government to pick particular religions for disfavored treatment. Malloy doesn't know what he's talking about, and any state officials that listen to him will be violating their oath of office. So, like, hmm. they fucked around. They are about to find out. Love it. Um, Love to see it. And also... Lucian Greaves added one last thing. He said Malloy's real concern is that the laws he is endorsing are so vaguely written, mm -hmm. which is why they're allowing satanic chaplains through the school doors, that it will hopefully, it will hopefully dissuade some states from adopting chaplain bills, mm -hmm. limiting the market for his chaplain licensing mm -hmm. mill. Well, because they're always trying to walk this tightrope that gives them the uh, the religious, quote-unquote, freedom that they think they deserve and need, but also making sure that gap isn't too wide that anybody who's not a specific Christian shape can fit through it. Like, it's... I gotta admit, I bet being a lawyer for them is really difficult because you really have to do a lot of fancy footwork to, like, yeah, get that line down. acrobatics and mental gymnastics I bet they have legal. to take their shirt off for it. <laughs> Swallow the sword. Uh -huh. Yeah, there you go. I mean, Shall haven't we... laughed twice today. This Nicely is a big done. day for me. Shall we move on to Tennessee? Oh, boy. Oh, they did shit in Tennessee this week. Oh, really? That's so weird. <laughs> Tennessee, it's usually such a safe haven for a reason. Um, so for nearly a decade now, Tennessee Republicans who have full control of the government, they've been trying to make the Bible the official state book, and they've failed, like, repeatedly. And just to give you a quick like recap here, in 2015, a guy named Jerry Sexton, he is a state representative, uh, he filed a bill to make the Holy Bible the official state book. And it didn't work because even though the KJV Tennessee... KJV or I believe KJV. Um, but when the, when the bill was passed in the Tennessee House, the Senate didn't even take it up. And that's partly because the Attorney General at the time said, you guys, this is unconstitutional. You can't do this. <laughs> guys, 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 guys. In 2016... Um, both chambers 
passed the same type of bill, but it was vetoed by the governor. Why? Because he knew there were legal problems with this and the House didn't have the votes to override his veto. In 2021, Sexton tries again. um, And this time it was also defeated in the chambers because Lieutenant Governor Randy McNally said the resolution trivialized the Bible because if you make the Bible the official state book, it's on the same level as like our official state flower. And like, no, it's better than that. So how dare you demean it by giving it's it better the same than a title. cardinal, how dare yeah. you? That it's, doesn't mean anything. It's a weird reason, but it whatever, it didn't work. Like they have a state flag, they yes. look at that all the time. You can look at And you, that's why you shouldn't just reduce the Bible to an official state, whatever. And what does he have against state flowers? Jesus Christ. Uh-huh. So Jerry Sexton has since retired. God, people get mad about the wildest shit. It's Tennessee. They have no other problems. Oh my God, they um, have so many problems. Haven't you? You're incorrect again. You're the, confused. Jerry Sexton has retired, but there's a new bill that took up his mantle of trying to get the Bible to be the holy, the, the state mm-hmm, book. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And they finally figured out how to do it. And it was just signed into law this week. How did Thank they do it? fucking Christ. I, I have been waiting on <laughs> tenterhooks to see if Tennessee could finally have the political will. They finally address sin. To make the Bible their state <laughs> book. What brave men So how did have. they pull it off when all their previous attempts had failed? And the answer is, well, they don't just have they just kept an trying. official state book. Oh, what Christ. they did is they said, we're going to pass a resolution to name 10 official state books and the bible is one of them and i'm gonna read you this list of the 10 books do you remember last week when we talked about political capital Mm -hmm. um my theory about people don't want to spend their political capital to do stupid shit has really been blown to hell because what the fuck are the can you imagine being an like a state elected official that is no small thing to be a representative for your community and you're like gang I am going to get a stamp on a Bible, and I swear to fucking God, it's going to change everything for Tennessee. Because now when you see the Bible in a bookstore, it'll have a stamp that says, one of Tennessee's official books. This makes me... That'll make you buy it. Insane. This makes me feel like an insane I'm going to read down the list of 10 books, because they clearly, clearly wanted to make the Bible the only official book, and they knew they couldn't get away with that. It would lead to lawsuits, and it pissed off a lot of, like, three Republicans or something. So to get around that, they're like, don't don't worry. We have nine other books we're adding to this list, and you can tell they haphazardly put this thing together in the worst possible way. Take one swing. Uh, Giving Tree. Oh, God, no. No? That's an actual decent book. I mean, it's a bad book, but, like, like, it's a book. Purpose Driven Life or something like that? Yeah, not bad. Okay, not number one. Farewell Address to the American People from George Washington. That's not a book. That's not a book. It's a song that also from has n- Hamilton. <laughs> that has nothing to do with Tennessee, really. So why is that one well, of Tennessee's Tennessee is official like books? two states away from Virginia. Yeah. Number so. two, Democracy in America by Tocqueville. Like the French dude who came around and said, hey, France, check out this democracy thing they're checking out. I've never heard of that book. Which is famous, but also what does that have to do with Tennessee? I've never heard nothing. of that book and I'm kind of a dork about history. It's Okay. Uh, we'll get back to the Bible in a second. Remind mm. me. Number oh, four. I'll <laughs> remind you. Uh-huh. Number four, the papers of Andrew Jackson, uh, which Andrew is Andrew Jackson. One of the worst <laughs> presidents. Andrew, Andrew yep. trail of tears. Jackson. That's the same one. Um, which are housed by like, the listen, university. The guy had a great head of hair. Nobody's denying this. <laughs> However, he See did commit genocide. So maybe you. we should take a beat. But also, I mean, even though they're housed by University of Tennessee in Knoxville, it's the papers of Andrew Jackson. It's not even a book. It's just it's his not papers. A book and Andrew Jackson, I was not a Tennessee dude. I don't think he may be, but like still. But the pa- his papers, his presidential papers are your state book? Okay. Stupid. Number five. This one makes sense. Roots by Alex Haley, who does have a Tennessee connection. There's Roots, also like the book about <laughs> the black experience in the yes, United States. Legitimate. Wow. They could have just named that the state book by itself and it would have been fine. Sure. They also have a couple other actual books here. Death in the Family by James Agee. All the King's Men by Robert Penn Warren. <laughs> They have American Lion by John Meacham. They wait, have wait. C- the Civil War, a history uh, by Shelby Foote, a famous historian, also kind of a Confederacy loving dude. But, oh, good. All right. good for him. And then finally, number 10 on the list, Code of Many Colors by Dolly Parton, 
which is a children's book that came out a couple years ago. Which With Joseph and the Amazing Technicolor <laughs> Dream Coat. The same. No, it's that it's a Dolly Parton children's book. But the thing is, like you can and stop and okra and gray and. No, I used to know no. all of the words. The problem with having that book there is like, okay, I get that it's Dolly Parton, but that book is not famous. That's a kid's book that she put out a few years ago, and it's fine. Is but it like, it's, about the biblical score, story no, of Joseph? No, it has nothing to do with it. It's about her growing up. Oh, um, oh it has nothing, has nothing to, to do with, with the Bible. It. It's just a children's book, and it's not famous. Like, It's just a Dolly Parton book. And I think the reason they included that is if you vote against this, you're in Tennessee, and you were voting against Dolly Parton. I think that's why you include that on the list. I look handsome. I look smart. I have no I idea what you're doing. I am a walking work so, of art. What's weird Donnie is Austin. that uh huh, Cormac McCarthy, famous author yeah. from Tennessee, yeah. doesn't make the list, which is weird. Sure. Well, um, I mean, you don't really want The Road as your top 10 <laughs> books of the state. I think it would give you a bummer. Feeling. It is weird that they're God, trying to honor. I hope honor... Cormac McCarthy wrote The Road. Sure, right? he did. Okay. Uh, Andrew Jackson's papers are treated as if they're worth honoring, which, like you said, they are not. He, it is notable that there's literally one woman on the list and one person of color on the list. Not what they were thinking, but just notable. Sure. He, uh, and a by lot the of way, those Andrew things Jackson are not books. died in Nashville, was not born there. Mm-hmm. Anyway, so this is a padded list to le- legally protect the only item they actually cared about getting on the list, mm. which is this Bible. Mm-hmm. But they don't just say number three on the list is the Bible. Because they snuck it in the middle. They didn't oh, put it first Oh, obviously. It's like when you're buying but, porn. You have to buy... You're like, you have to rent the two regular movies. Right. I want the Schindler's porn List. The, mm-hmm. I want the uh, other uh, movies. The English Patient. Yeah. And then, and then I want Debbie Does Dallas. Right, right, right. And, and then, then three <laughs> other documentaries. I got you. <laughs> the War by Ken Burns. <laughs> it's just six discs. Yeah. So... <laughs> But they don't just say the Bible. You guys, the 90s was so weird. I'm so glad I didn't have to rent porn in real life. That would have been miserable. They don't just say the Bible. They say the Aitken Bible. A-I-T-K-E-N. It's the Aitken Bible that they're putting on the list. A-I-T-K-E-N. I've never heard of that. Is that somebody's name? So why the Bible? Why this Bible? Why what the hell is the Aitken Bible? Here's what it says in the document. Okay. Okay. Whereas... On September 12, 1782, the Congress of the United States approved the printing of the first American Bible. When the American Revolution began, America stopped trading with Britain, cutting off our country's supply of Bibles and causing the printer for the Journals of Congress, Robert Aitken, to publish the first American Bible, also known as the Aitken Bible. Oh. And whereas Tennessee is home of the largest publisher of authentic reproductions of the Aitken Bible, the Aitken Bible Historical Foundation. Tennessee is also home to three of the five privately owned original first American Bibles remaining in the world today. Hello, it's me, Jessica. I have been listening to Telling Uh Jefferson Lies, so I can tell you actually all about the Aitken Bible. Yes, go on. Great. I'm so happy I get to use some stupid knowledge. So er, I think most of that is more or less true. They needed a new place to print, you know, uh, nationally. Um, And so Aitken offered to print this Bible. Mm -hmm. He... It was, I believe, the first Bible printed in the United States, Mm -hmm. and he gave it to Congress and said, hey, I think y'all should take this Bible. It's a gift from me, and I would love to be the national Bible printer of this fancy new country that we're in. This is correct. And uh, and he said, I would really, especially, I think these would be great for use in schools. Yes, he did say that. And to uh, which Congress (laughs) replied, nothing. That is correct. David Barton, the pseudo historian, has Thank been you, saying. Thank you, Warren Throckmorton. Yes, David Barton has been saying that version of the story in his presentation for years. I'm that so it was proud of myself. Printed by Congress. David Barton says it was printed by Congress. Mm-hmm. David Barton says it was intended for use in public schools. It wasn't. But neither of those is true because, like you said, Aitken went to Congress and said, make me the printer. No, Congress just didn't answer. They didn't endorse his Bible. Did I get any of the facts wrong? No, you got it right. The government chaplains confirmed, yeah, this is an accurate like translation of whatever Bible we're using. It can be published. Congress didn't buy copies of it. They didn't print it themselves. They didn't pay for it to be published. But they were like, yeah, that is the Bible yeah. if you're looking for like, I mean, it someone feels very to say. Much when you're establishing a new thing, everybody's trying to fill the gap of like, okay, you're going to need a printer. You're going to need somebody to build shit. You're going to need somebody to maintain yes. your buildings. I want to be that person. And the government's like, I mean, you're fine. Okay, Congrats go do on your, your thing. Fancy press. What about the thing about its use in schools? Which David Barton says, see, we got to get the Bible back in schools. Congress said we need to get the Bible back Congress in schools. Congress didn't say. Congress did not say that. 
Aitken said it was for use in schools, but Congress didn't say that. So, like, that's the thing the author was like, see, we can use it in schools. Mm -hmm. And it had nothing to do with anything. But because David Barton has spent years promoting the Aitken Bible Mm. as evidence that we live in a so-called Christian nation, this is practically canon in the world of Christian revisionists. That's why this version of the Bible made its way into the Tennessee bill Mm. and why the Aitken Bible is now one of Tennessee's official state books. David Barton also does not acknowledge the fact that Thomas Jefferson fathered like six or seven children with Sally Hemming. Um, He's like, no. And... Like, literally Monticello, like, the historical society, Thomas Jefferson. They're like, yeah, I mean, yeah. I mean, (laughs) yes. Yeah. And he's like... Our "Mm." job is telling you about Jefferson's history, and we're telling you David Barton is wrong about all this. Yeah. Um, It's also the inclusion of the Aitken Bible is a slap in the face to all these other deserving authors and books on the list. I can't believe Um, the Giving Tree didn't make the list. Yeah, because its inclusion, though, is cloaked in secular language. Like, they're not saying we want the Bible on the list because Jesus, Jesus. They're Mm. saying, no, it's historically significant. They probably are going to avoid any lawsuits Mm -hmm. about this, which was the problem in the past. Um, Meanwhile, by the way, there are other resolutions awaiting Tennessee's legislature uh, now awaiting the governor's signature. One of them uh, designates November as Christian Heritage Month. Oh, finally, we got Uh, a month for Christians. uh Uh-huh. Not December, by the way. No, by the way. (laughs) They want to take over November, too. And it's also, there's another... part of that Christmas creep. That same resolution... (laughs) urges citizens to learn more about Christian heritage in this state. Uh, Bill mean, Lee, the governor, is expected to sign that as well. Going to school, probably, in that state. I mean, listen, Tennessee doesn't need a stronger connection to Christianity. It needs less of it. Um, this but is, not with this resolution. This is, I didn't even do the thing where I look up to see where Tennessee lies in like education and uh, health care. You'll have and, to just keep scrolling down. Yeah. <laughs> So let's do Ooh, that was funny. One more story about education here. This poor, one involves North Dakota. Joseph, what you're gonna do? No. You should watch Joseph nope. the Amazing Technicolor nope. Dreamcoat you starring made me sir never want to watch it Donny forever. Osmond. He's not a sir. Red and yellow um, and North green Dakota and Republicans. Brown and <laughs> Black and okay. That sounds like a shitty song. No, I mean, it's literally, they say all of the... Listen, Joseph and the Amazing Technology of Green Crow was such a staple in my childhood that, like, my career path was directly tied to, like, I'm going to be a child. To, like, to my mom, I'm, like, six years I've old. I'm going to be a child, and then I'm going to grow up, and I'm going to be the narrator, which I have. Poor, poor All right, Joseph, I'm going to move on. What you going to do? And I'm going to knock a minute off this so that no one has to listen to this. <laughs> so North Dakota Republicans have Didn't know it was a biblical story until I was an adult. <laughs> have officially endorsed a Christian nationalist to take over their public schools. Oh, good. Uh, Which state? I'm sorry. I was... North Dakota. Oh. Oklahoma has already done this, you all oh. know. Uh, Ryan Walters is their education uh, guru, whatever you czar of education. And it's a shit show in Oklahoma right now. Ryan Walters... 130 staffers in his department have already left. They have missed out on grants provided by the federal government worth millions of dollars. That's my favorite one, is there's leaving money on the table for no reason. And it's become a haven for right-wing lunatics like the libs of TikTok person who he hired to be part of, like, their school curriculum advisor. Anyway. This is North Dakota This is in Oklahoma. Oklahoma. Now Republicans in North Dakota are like, we should do that too. And here's what I mean by that. They had their GOP state convention earlier this month, and the delegates to that convention voted like two to one ratio wise to endorse a guy named Jim Bartlett to be their next superintendent of public instruction. Mm -hmm. And that would make him, if he won the race, that would make him the highest ranking elected official overseeing education in the state. Mm -hmm. Now, this is only an endorsement. Uh, The official primary in the Republican Party takes place on June 11th. So the question is like, okay, the whole GOP is saying we're behind this guy. Mm -hmm. Technically, that doesn't mean anything because it's a question of, well, will voters care or not? Um, And it's North Dakota, so the Democrat in the race does not matter. (laughs) it's, It's a red state. But it's a weird decision on the GOP's part for two reasons. First, the current superintendent of education is as far as I can tell, I mean, she's a Republican, but as far as I could tell, she kind of knows what she's doing. Sure. Her name is Kirsten Baszler. Mm. She has served in this role since 2013. Wow. Um, 
she has experience in the world of education. She has served on school boards. She possesses an extensive resume. I honestly don't know if she's any good at her job, Mm -hmm. but in terms of like the qualifications you would want for someone in that position, it's like, yeah, I mean, she works with educators. She should have a good working knowledge of what the state needs, what it's doing and all that. If you do a quick Google search, you will not find that she's some radical, crazy Ryan Walters type of person. Um, And if you have a Republican in the job, who seems to be doing a regular job here, why are you saying, no, we're going with the crazy new dude who has no track record? I don't get that. Well, so that's one thing. Things are going too well around here. (laughs) Second is that Bartlett, the guy, Jim Bartlett, the guy they endorsed, he is an open enemy of public education. Oh. For example, he wants to eliminate the very office he's running for in order to make sure all decisions are made at the local level which is an idea that could end very, very badly because local leaders, uh, as we've talked about, a lot of people don't vote for their school boards. Mm -hmm. And if you give them all the power to do everything, that could end very badly, especially in a rural state like North Dakota. Is his goal that he just does not want education? No, his goal is let's turn it over to local control. And if locally they decide to do stupid shit, then I guess but we yeah, just got to let I'm them. What does like, he want to do? Yeah, what what does a his vision of sure. North Dakota look like? And is it and, may, and maybe <clears throat> maybe he genuinely thinks people at the local level are much more equipped to like educate in this like kind of that rural is environment. What his talking point is? Or is he fine with schools shutting down because what school they never necessarily done for shut down? But he wants to modify what they do. For example, he wants to hit. This is on his website. In glaring lights, or like at the top of the page, bring back the Ten Commandments. Oh boy, that's the opening of his website. Right under that, why are we bringing back the Ten Commandments? To restore the four R's: reading, writing, arithmetic, correct, religion. correct, correct, uh, and reality. No, which no, he doesn't You're define lying to reality. Uh huh. You're lying. He to doesn't me. define I, reality. So I'm wondering, I what does that mean? This. Like science? Like he you left religion t- on the table for <clears throat> reality? Yeah. I don't know what reality means in his vision, though. Does that mean we're not going to teach evolution because we're going to teach creationism? It means idolatry is is like top 10 problems in his life that he sees in North Dakota. And we need to we need to get on it by posting some rules. Yeah. There's another image on his website that's like a graphic design vomit. Uh, throw up sort of thing. It's just words with bad images. Can I it's see? yeah, you could see it. It's it's crazy. Um, <laughs> remind me to send that I one to you. Guy. Yeah, I I don't know. Uh, but one of the things he says on this word salad is that there was a oh, Christian boy. cultural context to the 1889 North Dakota Constitution, which requires the teaching of morals. Today, moral relativism has replaced the Ten Commandment morals with serious consequences. Idolatry. And this goes on for a while. People um, are coveting their neighbor's wife. Yeah, everywhere, right apparently. Left. Gotta teach the kindergartners not to take the neighbor's wife. <sighs> um, he also says on his website, one of his goals is to make sure speci- special education is handled like homeschooling or with private tutors, which That's is a horrible way it. to deal with. With special needs students who would apparently be deprived of social workers or other district employees with ex- expertise or, or if local control decided that was the way they wanted to go. it sounds like any kind of community. If everyone's like, oh, your kid has special needs, keep him in the fucking house. Yeah. Keep him up in the attic with your ex-wife. <laughs> he also adds that when it comes to education, the keys are recognizing God's legitimate authority, which is the fifth commandment, and socialism. I don't get that, but that is the grammar he used. And then he says the sixth commandment. Can you read that again? I will read that again because if you're wondering, wait, did that make sense? It the did. answer is it did not. The keys the key? went for to education. The uh-huh. keys are recognizing God's legitimate authority, fifth uh-huh. commandment, and socialism, sixth commandment, in education administration. What's the sixth commandment? The sixth commandment is no murder. What? Yes, that is the correct reaction. I don't know how that makes sense. Grammatically, I don't get it. I don't get the connection between socialism and no murder. But there you go. I don't know. He also said in an interview a couple of weeks. What could he have meant? I don't know. The whole website it makes no sense. Bad website. Make sure you send me a screen grab for the Facebook group because it's 
rotten. In an interview he gave a couple of weeks ago, he made a baseless claim that North Dakota, quote, is teaching 15,000 children how to be socialist right now. I yeah, don't know what that means. Is he talking about 15,000 Christians? Because Jesus was a socialist. I don't know. Um, at the convention, he gave an acceptance speech after they nominated him, endorsed him rather, consisting of claims that the state's constitution has a Christian moral context oh. and saying that kids need to return to Christian morals and then leading delegates in the singing of a biblical psalm. Red and yellow no, and green no, and Jesus. brown and violet How and black. How do I <laughs> cut all of that from this podcast? Um, by the way... Fargo, the biggest city in North like Dakota. Six people are going to love this episode. Yeah, and 90 of them are going to unsubscribe. In See response, you never, dorks. In response to the Fargo Public Schools, biggest school district, like uh-huh. the ones that know what they're doing, they released a manual recently meant to help staffers, administrators, parents be more inclusive of LGBTQ students. Mm. In response to that manual, oh, Jim Bartlett said... Fargo schools are an example of a modern Sodom and Gomorrah, Truly. which is destroying hearts, uh, minds, hearts, bodies, and budgets. He said, any person or organization involved in or enabling this radical transgender agenda should be identified and removed from the schools. Jesus this Christ. is child abuse, evil, and against the ND Constitution. God is judging this evil. Wait, wait. Once the evil philosophies are purged and a Christian context is returned under parental control, then the schools will be safer physically and psychologically. I mean, I think that child abuse is when people abuse children, like when priests do it Mm -hmm. and other religious figures. But yeah, learning that gender is a spectrum is very similar to that, I think. I was surprised. I think it's about the same as getting sexually assaulted by an adult is learning that gender is not binary. Mm. That. That feels good in my heart. Good job, guy. Yes. I was surprised that Jim Bartlett actually gave one interview to an actual journalist. Did he? A radio host. His name is Joel Heitkamp. And he asked Jim Bartlett, so under this Christian-centric leadership you want, like, would a Muslim person be allowed to be a school teacher? Like, what if locally <laughs> they say no or something? Like, we got to have Christian uh, schools. And the right answer is, well, of course. Of course. There's no religious test for right. You what know. did what did Jim Bartlett say? He said, "Fuck no, that's Fuck a, those dudes." Here's what he said: "That's a good question. Um, I think at the, that point, <laughs> I think at that point it would be looking at the teacher. Sure. Um, then he later in his answer, he never said just straight out yes or no. But then he said, you know, basically putting the value in numbers to what the parents actually want. He said we should look at the budget mm-hmm. and stuff like that. Then if they want, you know, so look much the budget to decide what ethnicities our teachers can be. You heard me." <laughs> Then he says, then if they want, you know, so much of this religion or they want to put social emotional learning in there or critical race theory or transgender, let's put a number on the balance sheet and profit and loss statement for each thing that they want. What just (laughs) happened to me? Yeah. Did I just black out? Yeah. Or did you there's like have a mild stroke? There's a dollar amount affixed to hiring a Muslim teacher that is different apparently than hiring any teacher. And you got to va- take that into consideration when you, the farmer, oh are God. managing your school board's budget now that you have taken over it and I have given you full control. I love, okay. I love this idea that my dude is going to sit down and be like, all right, they're Christian. Good. That's plus $30,000. <laughs> okay, they're Muslim. That's minus $500. Yeah. Oh, they've been to jail. Minus $2. Like, like is Christian, has molested children, plus $1,000. Like, right. truly. DEI I, minus three. I love this. This mm-hmm. makes me so happy. I would love to see this grant. I am a uh, an Excel enthusiast, and I would <laughs> love to see his work. Yeah. Um. So... The local news, uh, North Dakota Monitor, not local, like a newspaper, they reported that th- this guy's ascendancy is a sign that the state's Republican Party is, quote, shifting away from traditional candidates mm. in favor of those who are more conservative, which is a hell of an understatement. Yeah. But they did reach out to the current superintendent of public instruction, mm-hmm. Basler, the woman who has been doing this for years. And they're like, so what do you think that they did not endorse you? She wrote. Our convention process is flawed. Huh. It disenfranchises the tens of thousands of Republican voters who can't afford to take a Friday off from work or school so they could spend a couple thousand dollars to vote in these contests. Sure. 
Which is fair, fair, completely. Also, I did not know tens of thousands of people lived in North Dakota. First of all, I was in Fargo last year, and I saw like 37 or 38 people while I was there. There you go. Um, so, but the bottom line is she seems like she is not worried about this. Yeah. Because she's won races in the past. This is an endorsement from the North Dakota GOP, which is not what she's banking on. Yeah, she's, I know. She seems pretty comfortable, like, I'll win this she primary. She like she gets it. I'll is be she, fine. she is a Republican, but she just is a Republican. insane as adjacent one? As far as I can tell, she doesn't seem insane yeah. as far as Republicans go. Well, and she's been in power for over a decade, so, right. like, we would have seen you would evidence, have seen evidence of, it. of it. So, there you go. That's what North Dakota's up to. I will say, spending a couple of days in Fargo, the downtown Fargo area is really cool. Like, it's only... I don't know, maybe it's the eight thing about square red states. There's always a city or two that's fantastic. Oh, true. It's oh, my God. how far you go outside of Boise, yeah. Idaho. We went to a, a brewery because we had the dog with us. So we went to a brewery and obviously made fr- best friends with the bartender because that's sort of my jam. Um, and he talked to us a whole lot about being a gay guy in a red state and a blue dot and what that feels like. And because I was like, oh, my God, downtown is so cool. And he's like, yeah, but then you go two blocks. <laughs> it's like <laughs> that's the radius a Walmart you're allowed parking to work lot with. for the next 20 miles. Yeah. Anyway, I did like Fargo a whole lot. I got one last story for you. Great. Uh, This involves Louisiana because their Supreme Court just did something insane. Um, Let me give you enough backstory so this makes sense. In 2021, Louisiana's legislature, very red state, by the way, Mm -hmm. even though at the time they had a Democratic governor, Louisiana's legislature in 2021 passed a three-year window for unresolved sexual abuse allegations. A lot of states have done this. Basically, lawmakers realized that some victims of child sexual abuse, they're unable to wrestle with what happened to them until much later in life. But by the time they're ready to fight back, it may be too late. So by creating this three-year window, Louisiana became the 22nd state to allow victims of sexual abuse to sue their alleged assailants, Mm -hmm. even if the statute of limitations had otherwise expired. It was a way for victims to finally get justice. I mean, they would still have to prove everything. The alleged assailants are still alleged until they are proven otherwise. Um, But before that law passed, victims of sexual abuse only had until age 28 (laughs) to sue their attackers, which in many cases is... I'm 38 and I barely feel like my brain's all the way developed. There you go. (laughs) The sponsor of the bill at the time pointed out that the average age for child sex abuse victims to come forward and report their ordeals is 52. Is it really? That's what the sponsor of the bill said. And that's why they said, okay, you know what? 28 is dumb. Let's just open this three-year window for anyone to do it. Mm -hmm. And look, this is important. There are reasonable criticisms to laws like these. The main one is that people who are accused of abusing someone decades ago, they may find it really difficult to mount any kind of defense. Details are harder to remember. Mm -hmm. Witnesses to your side may no longer be around. Mm -hmm. Like, if an organization thinks the statute of limitations has expired, they may destroy otherwise relevant documents because why do you need to keep them around? Mm -hmm. So, like... On the defense Which side of this. Which is an argument against statues of limitation. Maybe we shouldn't too. be burning like shit that could be helpful. Now, the counter argument to all of that is, yeah, maybe hard for you. But at the same time, the burden of proof is still on the person making the accusation. Mm-hmm. And if it happened 30, 40 years ago, they're also going to have a hard time proving that you did this sure. thing. And if they can't prove it, then they're not going to. Then gonna, you're fine. Then you're fine. So like. It's also difficult to prove beyond a reasonable doubt that a, a attack had occurred a long time ago. The three-year window just gives those victims a chance yeah. to make their case. That is all. That chance is what uh, this guy named Douglas Bienvenue wanted when he filed his lawsuit. He filed a lawsuit with this three-year window mm-hmm. saying, well, I'm a victim and I want to go after my assailant. He said that he and several other boys in the 1970s, they were ages 8 to 14, they said they were all abused by a sexual, uh, by a Catholic priest. Mm-hmm. And in 2018, they sued the Diocese of Lafayette and another Catholic church But at the time, this is before the law was changed, in 2018, the Catholic Church said, well, the statute of limitations has expired and the case needs to be tossed out. Then Louisiana passed the law for that three-year window and the the plaintiffs are like, all right, well, we're within our rights to do this now, so let's go forward with this. 
the church says, well, that new law doesn't apply here because mm-hmm. now it violates our constitutional rights. We to no abuse longer, children. We no longer have proper legal recourse to defend ourselves. For example, we thought the statute of limitations has expired, so why would we have paperwork to do all, like, to defend ourselves? Okay. And what happened this week is that the Louisiana Supreme Court has taken the side of the Catholic Church. Mm. and what? But the way they did it is they said this three-year look-back window is unconstitutional. Wow. They said it violates the church's due process rights by basically eliminating the statute of limitation protections. In other words, it would be really hard for the church to defend itself. Mm. So screw the victims. And the end result is that the look back window in Louisiana has been declared unconstitutional and those victims have no way of getting justice. And a writer for the legal website Balls and Strikes, uh, an attorney, Steve Kennedy, he explained it this way. There was a dissent on the Supreme Court that pointed out the majority's treatment of an absolute property right to immunity from civil liability elevates that procedural right above other fundamental rights, like, say, not being sexually abused by an adult in a position of public trust. Basically, they're saying the legal right for the Catholic Church to defend itself matters, Mm -hmm. But the legal right for a victim of sexual abuse to get justice and go after their assailant, that one doesn't matter as much. Wow. Um, And so the problem with this... I mean... I understand. Like, I understand the argument on both sides. Like, I, I... I do understand it sucks and I then fuck the Catholic church and how dare they like try to protect themselves when all they have done is cause harm for children. Fuck the Catholic church, but legally, yeah, it makes sense to me. The argument though, then this is the problem. I do understand what you're saying. The problem with it is they're saying that the victims actual emotional and physical harms are apparently not important, but the theoretical harm done to the church mm. by requiring them to defend themselves decades after the alleged abuse occurred, mm. that one does matter. And the thing is, they're not alone here. Louisiana's yeah. not the only state to say these types of look-back windows are illegal. Uh, courts in Utah and Colorado have done the same, which is all a reminder that the legal system is not always a savior for the most vulnerable people in society. It, I would argue it's almost never right? a savior for the, the most rules, vulnerable people in society. The rules are written to protect the mighty, mm-hmm. but similar laws have been upheld in like two dozen states. Yeah. And the survivors network of those abused by priests, SNAP, they called on allies to raise their voices in pro- uh, protest. They said the Louisiana Supreme Court justices overturned a law passed by a unanimous legislature and signed by then Governor John Bell Edwards, who was supported by then Attorney General and current Governor Jeff Landry. Mm. All of these Louisiana officials, and they didn't say this, but Democrats and Republicans, they viewed the window as constitutional. Mm-hmm. The will of the people of the state was thwarted by four men. They also went on to say the majority opinion written by this justice said reviving old sexual abuse claims violated the due process rights of accused abusers and their enablers, which is just disturbing. They, the justices never explain in their ruling what the victims of child sexual abuse ought to do yeah. if, the fi- if filing a lawsuit decades later is not an option. Because there is no recourse. I guess they're just supposed to live with the trauma. Yeah, I mean... uh, So, good news for Catholic priests. As long as the abuse you caused happened a long, long time ago mm, in Louisiana, you're good. Yeah. It's all good. It's tragic. Well, and obviously this is a uh, travesty, but... uh, At any point, did anybody who's fighting about this say... Okay, well, how can we do better in the future? I mean, the Catholic Church has put out statements, in Louisiana included, like they put out statements like, of course we want the victims to be protected. But you guys, look at the paperwork. Oh my God, it's going to be exhausting. I have carpal tunnel. You know that. I have to sleep in braces. So like, come on. Uh, No, it's terrible. I, 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 it's disappointing. I do get it like you live by the sword you die by the sword when it comes to the legal system right like yeah frustrating it's but very frustrating and wrong i want to be clear Supreme about Court that is not alone no it's uh it's disappointing is what it is and that's all i got that is all you got um you can support this show by going to patreon.com slash friendly atheist podcast please do it it would mean a lot to us you can leave a review on itunes and we're going to talk about stuff Mm -hmm. on the bonus episode that is not connected to everything we were talking about right now. Um, I've got a uh, review. You can leave a review on iTunes. This one's from Pistol McGee. 
Um, one of the many flaws with iTunes is that I can never read the whole title. Um, a crucial fixture of the AC. Oh, the AC verse. <laughs> yeah. I rely heavily on uh, Atheist Skeptical Podcast to keep me informed and to remind myself that a lot of people are just as concerned about the same issues I am. Because I listen to several of them, uh, Hemant often chooses stories that I also hear covered by other shows, They be they thinking, scathing, or some other kind of atheist. <laughs> Even so the, the atheist thinking the, and scathing. The atheist verse. <laughs> Even so, the analysis and opinions provided by Hemant and Jessica are refreshing and often frame the story in a new and different way. And Jessica is fantastic. Thank you. Aww. She's the Cara Santa Maria of Jordan Holmes's. <laughs> Of Jordan what? Jordan Holmes's? You know what? That one doesn't make I don't know sense who Jordan Holmes is. I don't. But I know Kara. Could, She's could you lovely. look up Jordan Holmes? Eh, the, I'll uh, get around to it. the quote, one reports a story and the other reacts to it. Model can be done very well or very poorly, and Hemant and Jessica do it very well. In this dynamic, Jessica's job is undeniably the harder one. Oh, thank you. I was asleep five minutes before Hemant got here. <laughs> Hemant already knows the story and has time to think about it, to analyze and discuss it. Jessica is Coming in cold more often than not, her ability to roll with the story and punch it up on the fly is among the best I've ever heard. Oh, my God. I did not realize how nice that was going to be about me personally when I started. Usually, they end with some light Jessica bashing. Um, (laughs) That's really nice. I don't know who Jordan Holmes is, but I'm going to look it up, and hopefully it's a compliment. Um, (laughs) All right. We'll see. Bonus episode. Yeah, what are we talking about? Um, Honestly, it's most going to be like shit I've been watching due to... You know, health shit. I watched the movie, too. I'll talk oh, about it. Oh, did you? Um, so I watched the movie Gone in the Night. It's kind of a fun horror movie. Um, and then I... Uh, documentaries. Mikey and I watched um, The Program, which is about one of those, like, uh, military-style schools. Um, and all of the people are around my age, which was really interesting. It's just, like, people going back and reliving the abuse. Um, and then I watched a show called Renegade Nell that I really liked. And a... There's a Netflix series uh, called Homicide in New York, which was um, a really good reality true crime show that I'd like to talk about. All right. We'll see you next week. Bye.